And Lee, we'll just start again by uh, thanking you for stopping by. Like I said, I know you don't really have much going on. So yeah, I had so plenty of time to, to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start with something that I maybe a lot of people don't know about your background, which is that you were in college, the editor at a publication called the Harvard Voice. And you're a writer for the Crimson, I think, if memory serves me right. Yeah. Um, I was just going to start in this kind of place of, of, you know, maybe your first experience really with publishing online, but what was your experience mm -hmm. like at Harvard writing for the Crimson and editing the Harvard voice and kind of what did you learn running and contributing to uh, those publications? Well, actually my first experience publishing online was way before that. It was growing up with blogging platforms and publishing on a daily basis, almost on Zynga and LiveJournal and all of those early blogging platforms. Um, and actually probably like the best preparation I ever had for the, the writing that I now do is when I was in high school, a lot of people would have like, you know, hourly jobs, babysitting, whatever, mowing people's lawns. The primary way that I made money was by, um, was by submitting myself to essay competitions and winning essay competitions. <laughs> that was my side hustle. And if the prize money was substantial, like a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, like the hourly rate could be pretty high. It was better than having a minimum wage, like shopping mall job. So anyways, that was really good preparation for a lot of the writing that I now do. And then when I got to college, I started writing for the Crimson on the news, the news section. That was my first experience with like news journalism. And then I became the executive editor of a publication called the Harvard Voice, which was a monthly student magazine covering student life, um, profiling various students, um, covering various areas that were interesting to students. And so I was managing a team of writers when I was there. And we were doing lots of interesting multimedia experiments as well. Like we had a Tumblr blog called harvardfml.com. It was the first college FML site, which then rapidly spread to lots of other college campuses. Um, we live tweeted stalking Emma Watson at the Harvard Brown game, which um, was behavior that got covered negatively in a lot of other outlets. And yeah, it was just such a such a fun experience. And that was really good practice for writing really quickly because it was my first time writing like on a daily basis on deadline. Like for the Crimson, like if if you know, if something was not done by I think 5 p.m. like it would just not make it into the next day's paper because it was going to the presses so like I would spend all day reporting and then start writing at like 4 30 and then you have to like get a polished piece out within the next 30 minutes and so it was really really great practice for like learning how to write really quickly at high quality yeah so that's, that's something I'm excited to chat more about because I know you've talked a lot about consistency maybe being I don't know if overrated is necessarily the right phrase, but obviously you publish now on a bit more irregular cycle, but when you publish, it really is a deep dive and a really kind of staple piece of work. Um, and that's something I definitely want to get into during this conversation because it's something I think a lot of folks on the call are thinking about themselves. But I guess that, again, you've been generous with this story elsewhere, so I'll, I'll keep it brief, but how did you end up really honing in on the passion economy while you kind of went on to start your career and venture and like, why was that the space that you were really drawn to as a potential, potentially economic, uh, economically fruitful area, if that makes sense? Yeah, it was the convergence of a lot of different factors. Um, it was definitely influenced by the fact that I've been creating online for a really long time and was, um, like I mentioned, like blogging online, um, writing fan fiction online, participating in online forums. I grew up in a very online way and had a lot more online friends than I did IRL friends growing up. I was very cool, obviously. And then um, and then when I went into startups and technology and then venture capital, um, I was really interested in how technology was able to democratize access to different career paths and income opportunity, income, income earning opportunities, and um, really help people get connected to customers, fans, audiences, and be able to turn what they love to do into their livelihood, which was not really possible before, before the internet. Like if you had a very niche interest um, and you were really good at it, you were kind of just uh, limited by 
how many people in your own IRL network were also interested in that thing and could be your IRL customers. But I think the internet, as Ben Thompson has said more eloquently, the internet empowers niche in a really powerful way. Yeah. And I always think back to this example that I think Taylor Pearson put in his book of this woman who makes, you know, a generous living, 200,000 bucks a year or something, writing and licensing pirate songs online. Mm -hmm. And it's like so funny and specific and long tail yeah. um, that I, I certainly imagine that business 20 years ago would have been a bit of a tougher grind. Um, and this is that specific idea of like niche really being, you know, a, a powerful, uh, being kind of unlocked in a powerful way today uh, has obviously been this kind of thread in a lot of your writing and a lot of your work. And mm -hmm. a piece that I think probably a lot of folks on the call are familiar with is your kind of spin on Kevin Kelly's, you know, a thousand true fans, which is obviously your, your take was actually, it just takes a hundred, you know, super fans who really love your stuff to theoretically be able to monetize and, and sustain yourself. So there's like a whole bunch of stuff I'd love to unpack there. And yeah. the first thing, and feel free to add any back context to that, but the first thing I was really curious to get your take on, again, I know you think a lot about kind of creator platforms and, and the investing side of the creator economy, um, but from the creator perspective, you know, being someone who's also putting work out there yourself, how do you think about identifying a niche or a market, you know, where there's a hundred people who will even be willing to pay, you know, a mm -hmm. thousand bucks a year or whatever it might be for your uh, creations? Yeah. So it's interesting because I've actually recently spoken about the idea of taking it even a step further and, and having just one true fan. <laughs> um, and basically I was talking on my podcast, Means of Creation, recently because I had done this NFT drop and someone purchased it for $25,000. And I was like, this is such an interesting model because you really just need actually just one true fan. Like if you have one person who really intensely loves your work and wants to support it and wants to purchase it, like that person is potentially like really price insensitive and can be just like your sole source of income can be that one fan. Um, and obviously it doesn't have to be one. It could be like a small number of people. Like the point is like, you just don't need that many people supporting you anymore if you're able to monetize each of them to a huge extent. And then um, like in, in that world, I think you could have, a, you could put out a ton of your work for free. Um, you could do a lot of your creative pursuits, but it's being supported by a very small group of like super, super fans. The I call this the cult fan. Um, like the, the cult fans are willing to support you to basically any extent. They're willing to spend amounts that other people would find illogical or kind of insane level of, of support. Um, but they're, they're willing to do that because they just, they value that relationship so much. And it actually harkens back to kind of a Renaissance era style of patronage where artists had patrons and they usually had like a very small number of patrons, maybe just one family was their patron and that supported their entire creative output. And I think crypto unlocks that because it introduces ownership into digital media and ownership has this like emotional resonance for, for supporters and fans in a way that like access doesn't really. Um, so I'm really interested in like pushing that concept even further and like one true fan is kind of that idea. Um, but going back to your original question was like, which was how do people even find that niche? I think that was the question. Um, and how do you cultivate like a hundred true fans? Um, I think I, I haven't studied the recipe to do that, um, in, in extreme detail, but I think it's really just like, uh, like putting out work and content on the internet seeing what resonates with people and then growing outward from there. Um, and you can use different platforms as test beds for experimentation. Like I think Twitter is actually this really powerful um, site for experimenting with ideas, seeing what resonates with people, seeing what catches on, and then potentially um, giving that topic a deeper treatment through longer form writing. I oftentimes do that with my writing. I'll I'll tweet about it or tweet storm about it, see if it resonates, see if it's in a idea that like catches fire and like people really love. And then I'll 
if it does seem to have legs, I'll oftentimes convert it into a longer post. And, and through that process, you start amassing followers and finding like the, finding the intersection between your own interests and the interests of like the broader world. Yeah. I love this. First of all, absolutely love this idea of one true fan. This, you know, this is great because I just bought, I love Jeff Bezos dot com. So this could, this could really work out well. Mm -hmm. um, no, if only. Um, but I do love this notion of like, can you just find these people who I love the word cult? I think our mutual friend, Sam Lesson has talked somewhat about this on, on kind of cult driven uh, social platforms. And this idea that obviously, and you've talked about this extensively, all this power really accrues to the individual in kind of the age of the internet, or that's like the general trend. And um, I guess with like your writing in particular, um, one thing I was really curious about is how you've used writing, not necessarily to like directly monetize what you're doing. I mean, the NFT thing, I think it was, I know the, the artwork, um, but like you don't have a paid newsletter as far as I know. And you really use writing as kind of like this air support, if you will, and a lot of other ventures and things that you've taken on. Um, but how would you describe like how you've leveraged writing as this um, kind of accelerating force for the work that you do? And how mm -hmm. would you encourage people to, you know, think through the same question? Yeah. Firstly, I want to give a shout out to Taylor Lorenz, who also described cults in her writing. Um, she was actually really the inspiration for the idea of the cult fan. Um, but she had this amazing piece, I think, last year about the, the rise of cults on TikTok and how there were TikTok creators who were almost functioning as cult leaders and getting their followers to take certain bizarre actions on the internet and change all of their profile pictures to this one image of the cult leader. Um, it's just like really fascinating stuff. So um, the phenomenon is definitely happening on real, like in the real world on social media platforms. Um, in terms of writing and my own career, uh, yeah, I, I would say, actually, I do have a paid newsletter. Um, actually, I have two paid newsletters. One is the thing that I do with the Every Bundle. So I have a paid newsletter every week that breaks down news related to the creator economy and passion economy, um, where Nathan Bashez and I will break down a topic very deeply and sort of cover all of the news related to this industry. Um, so that's on every.to. And besides that, I've jokingly, jokingly called my LP updates my paid newsletter. So I send out a quarterly update to my limited partners for my fund, you know, talking about like portfolio companies and updates on performance and everything. And that is essentially a paid newsletter. Like you have to pay, you have to, you have to subscribe to the fund in order to get this newsletter. Um, so it's probably the most expensive newsletter in the world. Uh, but yeah, I think that's like a, a deviation from what people normally mean when they say paid newsletter. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like most of my writing is done for free. Most of my ideas are shared for free. Um, and it's used for me as a way to drive like top of funnel awareness of who I am and really help me build relationships with founders and with the whole ecosystem at scale without needing to spend like, you know, a ton of one-on-one -on -one time meeting literally everyone. With writing, writing has this really powerful quality, which is that the best writing is often evergreen. It's very viral. It can reach a ton of people. Um, and so it's, it's for me, a, a way to build relationships at scale. Yeah. And first of all, shout out to Means of Creation, which whoever is not uh, in every subscriber. I've now been subscribed so long, I literally forgot I was paying for it. Um, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> I won't draw attention to that then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. It, it's just like water. It's just part of my life now. And yeah, seriously, Means of Creation and, and a lot of folks on the call, I think will know Nathan and some of the other folks at Every. And like, that's just been so much fun to follow because if there's ever something interesting happened, typically Lee and Nathan are talking about it. So Big shout out if you're not already a, a subscriber. Um, yeah, one thing I was really curious about is like with this broader kind of creator ecosystem, there's the really new kind of cutting edge stuff like the NFT, um, ex not even experiment at this point. It, it's far bigger than that. Um, but you obviously had recently had success monetizing there. Um, what are some of the other just like business models that are relatively new or seem promising that you find yourself intrigued by for people who are, you know, regularly creating online? Is it, 
as simple as just launch a paid subscription and like that's the you know everyone can make a living doing that or there's some other kind of novel techniques that you find yourself intrigued by yeah i'm really interested in crypto <laughs> i know that's probably what everyone is saying right now but that's just where i'm actually spending a lot of my time um i think crypto and the new business models that it unlocks are really fascinating fascinating for creators because it basically unlocks the ability to be a super fan um, in the NFT example, like someone, it really um, introduces like this powerful price discovery mechanism. Like I would have never priced my NFT at $25,000 ever. Like I, I thought people wouldn't even bid on it at the reserve price, which was, I think like $3,000. I thought that was maybe too high and I had overshot myself and I was planning to like Venmo a friend so that they could bid on it and make it look like it had some activity. <laughs> But the, like the, the price just skyrocketed to, you know, where the market deemed it was worth, um, which was really, really fascinating. But then I think crypto is also really powerful because it unlocks this like financial alignment between the creator and their investor. Like you're no longer just a passive supporter, you actually become an investor. And I think um, financial incentives are oftentimes way more powerful than altruistic incentives. Like if I'm going to be thinking about like how I allocate my money, I would rather have my money be allocated to something that can earn me a return versus just be like a sunk cost. Um, and so I think it potentially unlocks like the ability for creators to monetize at a much bigger scale than they have been to date, because to date the model of creator monetization online has usually been you know, supporting a creator out of altruism, that's like the Patreon model, or purchasing and engaging in a single transaction where the user gets some sort of utility or value, um, and then that transaction is over and it doesn't really continue unless there's like more value to be gained. Um, whereas I think crypto introduces the potential for longer term alignment and upside and sharing in the upside of the creator's success, which I think it's just way more powerful as an incentive mechanism. Yeah. And do you kind of um, see this world in which creators, you know, in five or 10 years, maybe even sooner kind of function as like, there is a market of creators that more or less you can invest in and out of for, for lack of a better comp, like to the stock market where um, there really is this market of independent folks that are their own entity and business and like have a certain growth trajectory um, you kind of envision a lot of the economics around creators kind of going in that direction? I do. Yeah, I think that's going to happen. I'm not entirely sure how that gets implemented and what the, you know, enabling technology is and how it gets, you know, regulated either. But it feels like that is inevitable and that will happen because it just makes so much sense. Like it, it, it right now, like if you are a fan of a creator, you basically only get bragging rights that you were a fan or you get to like donate to them or buy their, their products in order to support them. But there's like no mechanism to participate in the financial upside of that creator. Um, and I think that is going to change just like for companies, like there's a, there's a mechanism to invest in a company if you really believe in that company. Um, I think the same will happen for creators. And especially, I think it's going to, uh, I think initially what'll happen first is like established creators invest in emerging creators. Like it's going to become firstly a relatively closed off asset class. Um, so established creators who are maybe accredited investors will invest in emerging creators and provide this bundle of like capital, advice, mentorship, distribution, like it just really makes sense for creators to be investing in other creators because they can provide like real value add um, versus like a random financial investor. And then I think that gets democratized to like all users and all audience members who might want to invest as well. I love that for me. That was literally going to be my next question, which is like the only, there's almost like this getting started challenge that a lot of high potential folks might have, but it's like, you know, who's going to be the first one to buy my NFT if I'm not already well known. And like, mm -hmm. there's almost like this, this challenge of getting started. So you're kind of envisioning, and, and maybe there's obviously more to it than this, but you're seeing this world in which maybe folks who have already had some success and traction kind of help 
support and bring up that next wave of, you know, people who are up and coming who really could succeed as creators. Yeah, for- totally. Yes. And this happens already in some industries. Like it happens in the finance world. Like people leave hedge funds or they leave investment firms and they get seed capital from the people that they used to work with, a more established firm. Um, and that's a way to like align incentives and be able to um like when the talent goes off and strikes out independently, that's a way to still um, align yourself with their success. For creators, like nothing like that exists. Uh, when someone is an independent creator, like no one has a vested interest in your success. No one is there to provide seed capital. Um, like you have a network of other creators you're collaborating with, but you don't really share in each other's success. And I think. Like it, it, that just makes sense. I talk to founders all the time, startup founders in Silicon Valley who tell me that they like figured out ways to like pool together all of their equity in their own respective companies with their friends. And so that, so that friends are investing each in each other and have exposure to each other's success because they're kind of side by side building their own companies and they want to like give some of it to the people who are supporting them and also to basically diversify themselves. And I think creators are analogous to that. Just totally love it. So this is, um, I'll, I'll plug it in because it's just very timely, but David asked about uh, specifically BitCloud, which has been you know a bit buzzy the past week or so. Um, but what's your kind of take on uh, <laughs> oh my maybe gosh. Bit, the BitCloud as a whole and their, their approach? To be honest, I don't know enough about BitCloud to really have an informed opinion. I I have to like dig a little bit more into like how it actually works. There's been there's been a lot of opinions <laughs> about it that I've read, um, but I haven't like validated any of those claims for myself. So I don't want to speak without knowing the full story. Love it. Cool. We'll we'll see how it plays out the next few weeks and uh, if if it lives up to the hype or not. Um, I will say that I think my market cap on BitCloud is offensively low. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is with that. Like, that's the part that I disagree with. <laughs> there you go. Not financial advice, but if you are going to make some <laughs> trades on BitCloud, we have an undervalued asset. <laughs> we, we know. I, this is not investment advice. I've heard that you can't get money out. You can only put money in. So perhaps don't do anything, guys. That's a good business model. I think BitCloud might be onto something there. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So, okay. So this is something I'm really curious to get your take on, which is like... Uh, If I'm a, I guess for lack of a better, just for simplicity's sake, maybe someone who is primarily a writer, I have a sub stack that I'm actively growing, people really enjoy what I'm writing, et cetera. How do you kind of think about like which routes to monetization make sense for somebody? Like when does it make sense to maybe do an NFT play or start thinking about a crypto, uh, you know, opportunity where folks could have a part of the upside versus investing very heavily and doing a paid subscription or launching a course, how do you just like generally think about which routes to monetization make sense for kind of which types of of people? Yeah, so I think it's like a very complex multivariate function for monetization actually. So there's no like one size fits all, like first do X, then do Y, then do Z. I think it really, really depends on the individual and specifically the factors that it depends on is probably, you know, what, what is the content format that you're trying to monetize? Um, Because the path to monetization for a podcast is going to look very different than a newsletter. I think it depends on the value that you're offering. Like, is it educational? Is it business? Is it technology? Are you helping people in their careers? Is it entertainment? Each of those is going to suggest a different monetization path. Um, I think the intensity of relationship with the audience is also another factor. Like, do you have a small but loyal audience base that like loves you and treats you as their cult leader? Or is it more um, utility based and people read it because it's like giving them some tangible value in their real, real day, real life day to days. Um, I think all of those dimensions are important to consider when thinking through monetization. Um, for newsletter writers in particular, at least the ones in my network who are typically writing about technology, business, that sort of thing, 
Um, I think the path to monetization typically looks like, you know, first build up a free list, like start by writing for free. Um, then once you get to a certain scale of followers, like I think probably around six to 8,000 tends to be the rough, like recommended order of magnitude-ish, um, then you can introduce a paid tier. And then um, there's probably benchmarks for how much of your free list is going to subscribe to paid and then start slowly growing both in tandem. And it seems to be the case that no one ever gives up on the free tier because the free tier is used as top of funnel lead generation. And then some of those will convert to paid. Um, that seems to be the recipe. I am really interested in how crypto changes this. Sorry if I sound like a broken record about this, but like I think the the current business model of subscription newsletters is a bit limiting and it's, it doesn't work for everyone. I think it also poses this like tremendous tension between like, what do I put behind the paywall? Do I put my best stuff so as to reward the people who are paying or do I put the worst stuff so that I can give the best stuff away for free so that like people are in, discover me and are incentivized to subscribe? Um, and I think writers aren't necessarily just optimizing for money, they're optimizing for influence and their thinking being as widespread and wide reaching as possible. And the subscription business model is inherently at odds with that because if you're charging for something, it can't be free and available to everyone. Whereas I think with crypto, it can, like you can both, um, you can both, uh, like, monetize something um, by like having the original version of it be an NFT and being sold to your super fan, but you can also still have it be accessible to the entire world without charging. Yes. And actually Sarah just dropped in the perfect question. Cause I was about to, I was about to make a confession, which is like, I actually don't know if I, as someone who has actually got really into crypto for, for, on and off for many periods, <laughs> I actually don't know if I fully wrapped my head around this. It's like so crazy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, not only necessarily maybe the NFT thing, which I, I think I have a pretty good or decent grasp on, but just like generally, um, and maybe that's what you're referring to when you say crypto. So set me straight there. Um, but just like generally the notion of maybe uh, being able, uh, enabling folks to have a part of the upside of your success as a creator, does that kind of look like issuing some sort of token that, you know, has a limited supply that, you know, represents, um, I don't know if ownership is quite the right word, but, you know, is representative of you as a creator. Do you have kind of like the explaining the crypto monetization model to your grandma pitch that you can share with folks like me who are uh, slow to the game? Yeah, I think probably the most simple um, model that I've seen implemented uh, for writers in crypto is just like the essay itself as an NFT. So minting the essay as an NFT, selling that and monetizing that like kind of canonical instance of the essay um, so that there's an owner of that NFT. And then the essay itself can still be published broadly and made available for free for folks. Um, but you have that one true fan who is supporting you um, by purchasing it. And there is a platform called mirror.xyz, mirror.xyz is the name of it, mirror like reflection mirrors. Um, and they are um, a platform that basically enables writers to do this, to mint their essays as NFTs. Love it. Super helpful. And yeah, that's, um, that has been just an amazing experiment to watch. And just like seeing your success there has been very exciting, but also just seeing a lot of other folks start to have some traction there. It's just like an interesting glimpse into the future. Um, yeah, it is really, really interesting. It's, it's super interesting stuff that's going on. Like the generalist just launched their yes. crowdfund of their Coinbase S1. Um, and basically their, uh, what happened was like they, they ran a crowdfund. And so supporters in the crowdfund um, were like, I think they raised up to like 10 ETH, which is, or maybe 20 ETH, like a pretty large amount of money. And the idea was that this pool of money from the crowdfund would actually go towards like funding the production of this report about the Coinbase IPO. Um, and so they used this pool of money, the 20 ETH to go fund all of the analysts who were going to do research and write up this report um, about the, coin, the Coinbase um, S1. 
And then when the essay got published, it was auctioned. It was actually broken up into three chunks and each chunk was minted and listed and auctioned off as an NFT. And those proceeds flowed back to the original crowd funders. Well, I mean, I just can't help but think of like the thing that's been broken with journalism in the age of the internet is like, it's hard to find a business model where you can justify paying somebody a full-time salary to do research on some story that may or may not go anywhere um, and like kind of go down a hole for 12 months as a true investigative journalist. I know the, the journalist is more like business writing. Um, and I've been thinking about that a lot. Like, you know, the paid Substack model requires you to yeah. publish a lot more regularly. So like, is that, you know, this big hindrance on quote unquote investigative journalism or, or deeper? Yes, I've thought about that too. And I think it is because I think there's like so much writing that cannot work in the subscription model. Like the, the business model is a, determines the content. Yeah, I, I think business model and content is so tied. And the, the subscription business model basically limits you to creating content that is frequent in nature. There's a regular delivery of the content. And that regular delivery of the content will make readers feel like they are getting a consistent amount of value that is in excess of the subscription price. It doesn't really work for super episodic writing, the type of writing that I'm doing where I publish like four times a year. Um, it doesn't work for like investigative things where maybe a journalist is spending years like reporting on a story that may or may not even amount to anything. But there's like a huge upfront investment before anything actually gets created. Like subscriptions just don't work for that. You, you really need like a group of people with really keen interest in that topic to fund you up front, um, almost like, you know, VCs go and fund startups. And what I love, and again, I'm, <clears throat> I feel like the old person here trying to wrap my head around this, but like, it is distinct from like a GoFundMe in that it's not about, it's not, it's not just about funding it to see it come to life. It's about having a part of the upside if yeah. it is successful exactly. and gains traction later. Yes. Yeah, I literally, a lot is slowly starting to click for me and I'm like, wow, I really need to pay more attention to this. <laughs> Feels so late the game. Yeah, it's- It's, it's okay, like, it's never too late. Totally, yeah, right. That's what they said when I bought Dogecoin. Um, this is, um, God, I, I, I'm tempted to like spend the rest of our time on this, but I will move on just because I know there's a lot we want to cover. Yeah, and I would say like this is uniquely empowered by crypto. I mean, you could theoretically like program this in the Web2 world. If you were to like build a Kickstarter that, you know, kept track of like, I guess, I guess the pieces that we need to happen would like, would be that you need to like have some mechanism of not only accepting payment from the crowd funders, but also like remitting payments to them. And then um, you need some mechanism to like auction off the finished piece. Um, and, like, I'm not entirely sure what that would mean in the Web2 world. Maybe there's like a signed and autograph version and you like auction that off and that gets sold. And then the proceeds would go back to the, to the crowd funders. I think that would be like the centralized Web2 version. But what is uniquely enabling about crypto in this situation is that like um, you have like all of the data lives on chain. Like you have um, everyone who crowdfunded into the original campaign, like you have their wallet addresses, you can pay them, um, like you, you can pay that, you can send money to that address. Um, you know, you have the record of how much everyone contributed exactly. Um, so proportionally, you know how much they would be entitled to once the piece actually sells. And then I think digital ownership and like selling a digital asset, like an essay online is uniquely empowered by crypto as well. Exactly. Cause you can't, it's so difficult to do the authenticity check on a digital file, right? Like, right. No, this exactly. is the original PDF. I swear. It's like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> <laughs> very, very difficult to do if you can't, if you can't like sign it. Um, yeah, my mind is blown. I'm realizing we should have just done like a crypto talk. I, I will, we'll do a round two or something, but, um, that is fascinating. I think like just the new internet powered, uh, uh, writing business models are like 
endlessly fascinating. Every day I feel like I learned some new um, approach. And with that, I will foray into some new topics, but that is fascinating. I feel like I just got a, a glimpse into a, the wonderful future we're headed into. So um, <laughs> speaking of the future we're headed into, obviously you recently announced your fund and I know this had been kind of in the works, but you announced your new fund, which is obviously investing in a lot of these creator economy companies. And um, I guess beyond like the general rise of, um, you know, the internet and like the, the kind of passion economy, if you will, um, what other like big trends are you betting on? And like, what are some of the things that you're really putting money behind kind of the macro themes that you're really uh, excited to back? Yeah, I would say um, at a high level, the mission of the fund is to democratize access and like democratize access to work income, opportunity, make the world more equitable. That's like the overarching ethos of the fund. And everything that I support rolls up into that mission in some way. Um, so one initiative that I just announced actually, um, I think a couple days ago, is this new initiative that I'm gonna be kicking off to train creators to become angel investors. Like, I think it's just bizarre that only venture investors can invest in startups. <laughs> like, I just don't, I'm not entirely sure why the world was configured in this way. And I don't think it should be that way. Like creators are the ones that are contributing value to these platforms. Like platforms are valuable because creators are investing their time and creating content for them. But creators, like they only have the upside of like creating their own business on the platform, they don't actually have any upside in the underlying platform itself. Like if you're building a business on Patreon, yeah, you get like the revenue that you make from your own Patreon page, but you don't get exposure to Patreon as a business itself. And I think that needs to happen. And I think one of the first steps that I'm taking is like helping creators figure out how do I actually angel invest? Like how do I pick companies to invest in? What should I be looking for? Um, we're also going to be covering like advisory agreements, how to get exposure to startups without having to like invest their own capital. Um, and then in a few years, I think my vision is like in a few years, I think the relative power of VCs, like pure VCs is going to decline and the relative power of creators will grow in the startup ecosystem like creators are going to be some of the most sought after investors and partners for companies versus just like financial investors. Um, and so I hope to be an enabler of that. And I know that that like means that maybe someday I get deprecated and like I become less sought after as an investor, which is fine. Like I think the value should flow to whoever is providing the value. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in that. Um, and in general, just like new models of um, how we can give people access to the means of production and creation and ways of earning money and being entrepreneurs and being owners. I love that. And one thing, um, yeah, I share your kind of bafflement at why, you know, professional investors are the only people who can write checks into companies. And I wonder if there's a weird history of fraud and by trying to protect consumers, by not letting them invest, you end up actually excluding a huge number of folks. And I'm sure there's a lot more cynical reasons. Um, but another, another thing I'd just love to get your take on is like, do you imagine the shift from basically the powers of more or less institutions, but in this case, maybe like traditional venture capitalists to creators, do you think that's a function of like distribution being the real challenge for a lot of companies and creators being, obviously the means of distribution. Yeah, um, or is that yeah kind of exactly. Yes, yes. So I should caveat all of this by saying that it's like very scoped to consumer investing. I don't know anything about enterprise. Probably most social media creators cannot really help enterprise businesses grow. Like that motion seems quite different. But if you're building a consumer company and that consumer company is predicated on broad consumer adoption, then creators I think are uniquely helpful there because they represent like, having a built-in audience space who is has like is paying attention to that creator and would be really receptive to whatever products they're 
they're plugging and, and promoting. So um, yeah, I think in the consumer world, creators are going to be really valuable as investors because they represent such an unfair advantage when it comes to distribution. I'm curious, do you think this same thing is kind of playing out with like media institutions, like the the trend being, you know, but this is not a, a not bad mouth numbers, I'm a huge fan, but like a, a trend away from a, the New York Times and towards Taylor Lorenz as an individual. Um, do you think that's also just like a general direction that you're betting on is just individuals really being where people go to get the vast majority of their information? Well, I think there's this like, cyclicality to it where like for every for every established um writer out there who has a personal brand they likely got that brand by working at an established media institution and so media companies are basically functioning as like talent incubators for the next generation of creators at least in like the media world um and so like, yeah, these media companies are training the next generation of like independent creators who I think at some point in their journeys, like they realize like, oh, actually I could, I could benefit more by going independent than staying at this company. And so I'm going to go do that. Um, I think like, I'm not entirely sure what the solution is because I think media companies obviously would prefer that not to happen. Um, and so they're probably going to think of new ways of retaining talent and like new incentives to better align themselves with the talent even as they grow. Um, because today I think media companies offer that training ground and that initial like boost of credibility to the creator, but they're not really getting the upside of their careers after they depart. Yeah. And this is, um, again, I know a lot of folks on the call will be familiar with, with every, with the bundle, but I think Nathan and Dan, I know you've been really heavily involved there. Their model of kind of this writer collective is a very interesting, familiar yet new model that seems like it could kind of play to some of the best incentives of, of either world. But I'm curious if you view collectives and maybe these, I don't know if rebundling is the right word, um, but like partnerships for lack of a better word, kind of being what the new media companies end up looking like in 10 years. Is that... Do you think that's maybe a sign of things to come? Yeah, I think that could be a possibility um, where, yeah, I think media companies basically will have to emphasize like how hard it is to do this on your own and emphasize like creator burnout and the importance of having a team and like shared resources and having a back office, like all of the things that a creator might not actually enjoy doing, um, I think will be things that the media company emphasizes in order to retain the talent. And then I think um, they'll probably also have to do some sort of like profit sharing where um, the creator retains more of their upside. So as they grow, like they would still want to stay and, and be able to capture more of that upside. I think that does introduce some sort of perverse incentive inside of media organizations though. Like if you were an employee at a newspaper and you knew that there was like this potential for profit sharing down the line, you would obviously try to probably pick a beat that is more lucrative <laughs> for which there would be more subscribers than to pick like covering uh, city hall or like some really niche topic that people don't really care about. Maybe that's already going through people's minds today, but I think there are, there are topic areas that are important to cover. And I think that people need to still cover that aren't as lucrative. And I'm just not entirely sure what happens to those. Totally. Yeah, I think, yeah, for sure. There's like, th this is almost just like the forever challenge of like, as much, as much as many of us are capitalists at heart, it's like there are these misaligned incentives where, you know, certain topics, you're just going to have a much stronger financial incentive to invest in and cover and many other important things will go overlooked and there has to be a way to, to reconcile the two. So I kind of share your concern there. Um, one thing I guess I was curious about is like, there's obviously, and we're, we're the biggest proponents of like the benefits of writing and publishing online and building an audience. And this is something we think a lot about, but I was super curious to ask you of like, have there been any drawbacks or unexpected, like, you know, are there ever days where you just kind of want to turn it off and be able to go off the grid 
um, or has just generally having a larger online presence been a you know unquestionable net positive? Because I think this is something that folks are also trying to work through as they invest in building out their presence online. Um, no, I mean, I want, I want to quit the internet like every day. There's like a, yes. a moment yeah. every day where I'm like, I'm sick of this and I just want to go off the grid. Um, <laughs> yeah, it can be a lot. Like there's definitely trolls online. I think, especially for women, people are very critical and will leave like mean comments and like, I also don't want to be the VC who, like, doesn't have my DMs turned on. So I leave I like, I like, leave my DMs open because I don't want to be, like, you know, warm introductions only. But, like, the DMs are, get really, really overwhelming. And there's, like, stupid stuff that comes into the DMs all the time that just, like, like turn a good day into a bad day. Um, that happens. So these are, I mean, there's definitely downsides to being very public and having an online presence. But... I think it's just kind of par for the course now and you kind of have to do it if you want to be an online creator. So the alternative path is just to get a regular job where you don't have to build an online presence and work for someone else <laughs> who has a brand. That's like the alternative. And so I'm like I'm I'm fully aware that like being an online creator is not for everyone. It definitely has drawbacks. I've quit like Twitter many times in the past <laughs> because there's been periods where like I tweet something totally innocuous and it gets taken out of like spun in a different way. And I just get so frustrated that I like don't tweet again for six months or something. But then I always come back because I'm like, this is like a tool that I need to leverage as an investor. Yeah. And I'm like... Part of me like hopes we're still in the, the dark ages of the internet where over time, better, better products, better best practices, a better culture around the internet will help mitigate. I feel like sometimes we're like driving in a car before seatbelts were made and like we haven't actually figured out how to maximize this thing for its, you know, best intended use cases. And as a result, you know, we're more or less, again, driving in a car without a seatbelt using lead-based paint in our house, like the, all that stuff is still happening. The, the internet equivalent of that is playing out right now. And, and I agree. I think it like inordinately affects women for like just these horrible cultural reasons. And like um, my hope is obviously that these platforms and society generally just starts to chip away at the more negative aspects of the internet and you're know, really constructing towards the best positive use case, which we've done with lots of other technologies. And it just like, you know, hopefully we can do it here too. Yeah. I think Twitter just needs to fix its DMs. Like that would be, that would, that would honestly be such a huge step. If it did that, it would solve like a ton of problems for people, I think, because today it's binary. Either you close your DMs and only people you follow can message you, or they're open to literally everyone in the world. <laughs> Like there needs to be some in between, I think there's like something in the middle perhaps that they could explore where they do some like light quality filter and, and maybe allow you to block certain words or something. I think that would make a massive difference in just like the tone of the platform, but I don't know if they're ever going to prioritize that. I know you hope and yeah, like God, it's a long game and the scale at which they operate is jarring and yeah. Anyways, there's lots of forces vying for their attention. Um, okay. So in the last five minutes here, one thing I was really curious to ask, and, and maybe we covered it, but I'm curious if there's anything that you wish people asked you about more often, like topics, maybe you don't get a chance to really talk a lot about new things you're kind of thinking about, but just generally curious if there's like, yeah, just questions or topics that um, you wish you have, you know, spent more time being asked about. Hmm. No, I think, I think we covered a lot of it actually. <laughs> yeah, this was really good. I, we, we explored a lot of topics that I usually don't talk about. So well done. Yeah. This NFT thing, I'm like, sorry, I just say crypto more broadly. The NFT thing I was able to wrap my head around like slowly, but surely, but just the general play with crypto and like a lot of the examples you gave have really expanded maybe my sense of what's possible there. Um, and actually, Dan Runcie, who, who we had on last week, talked a lot about this, how like in a subscription model, for example, like if, if 
the CEO of a company is paying the same amount as your grandma who pays to subscribe, you're clearly leaving a lot of money on the table. So I love how you think about finding these super fans and finding a model that will really allow them to support you. So that's actually like just a huge takeaway that I have so far. And maybe, um, maybe something I'll end on is Sarah's question here that that's in the chat around, um, is the word kind of creator synonymous with artist these days in that, like, how do you think about maybe that dichotomy between being a creator in the true creative sense of creating new, new work, um, and of being an entrepreneur who's a bit more like business minded and pragmatic. How do you think about that? Like tension, uh, as someone who is, you know, looking to build their presence in a business online. Yeah, I think of creators as um, people whose fame or influence originates from online channels. Whereas artists, um, I think there's a couple of di distinctions. Artists could be offline. They could have no presence online. They could just be a purely offline artist. Um, and then secondly, I think artists, um, the other distinction that I would draw is like, I think creators are creating things online with the purpose of, with the intention of having it be consumed by an audience. Like they're creating in service of other people and they, they want it to be seen. They want like their creations to add value to people's lives. Whereas I think artists are more motivated by the intrinsic satisfaction of just like being creative and they're okay, you know, making a painting, even if no one sees it, like just for the joy of painting and creative self-expression. So I think there's like, um, the intention around like what they're trying to do and the scale of people that they're trying to reach is a little bit different. Love but it. these so, are my own arbitrary definitions, by the way. <laughs> no, I kind of like it. If I ever launch a paid newsletter and it doesn't go well, I'm just going to say it's okay because this was art. This was yes, not a business. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an awesome dichotomy. And um, first of all, welcome anyone. If you have any last minute questions to, to drop it in the chat. But um, Lee, I just want to thank you for all the insight here. I feel like this has just kind of really stretched my imagination of how the kind of business model of online writing might really evolve. And I almost have this sense, having spoken to you and through this conversation of feeling like we're in this very early moment in what will be this history of the internet and like that the possibilities are actually maybe far more vast than should I launch an online course or do a paid news, you know, pay, paid subscription. It really does seem like a fascinating new frontier that we're entering. And um, so, like I said, if you are not subscribed to Means of Creation, please do it. And with three minutes on the clock. Let's end with Lyle's question here, which is, oh yeah, this is what I needed to hear. Lee, maybe this is the note we'll end on. How do you balance your creative work, writing, doing means of creation, et cetera, with your entrepreneurial work, raising money, investing in companies, executing? That's the perennial challenge. Uh, I will say I have people helping me with creative work. So with the means of creation, Nathan does a lot. We have another person who's our producer who helps a lot with it. Um, and so it's not like a one woman show. Um, like the fact that I publish so infrequently on my own newsletter is a reflection of the fact that I'm trying to juggle it with managing a fund and being an investor. Um, so yes, it's, it, it is a lot of work. And I think it's really tough to both be a full-time creator and a full-time fund manager. So I'm kind of like a full-time fund manager and half of a creator. Well, amazing. You are doing an incredible job at both and it's been a blast following along. So um, I will send out the recording here shortly and um, we'll send it out to everyone who is not able to join us live. But Lee, I just want to thank you so much for kind of all this hard-won wisdom and, and for making the time. Yeah, thank you guys so much for being here. Awesome. Great to see everyone. Yes. Okay. Great seeing everybody. Thanks for the awesome questions. And Bye. until next time, we'll see ya. Bye.